I have plugged in my mic. <laughs> Ready to go? Yeah. Okay. Well, hello, lovely listeners, and uh, it gives me a great honour to welcome today's guest, uh, which is Joanna Renoth or Renoth. I'll probably sabotage that. All good, all good. Um, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Renoth works. Renoth, okay. Joanna <laughs> is um, an artist of life. She inspires people to live life like an artist, creating a masterpiece, which is wonderful, a wonderful way to look at it. Mm -hmm. um, Joanna calls herself an agent of change and inspiration and is a multidisciplinary artist of life. Um, so you, you talk about the fact that you know, life with, with its bad and its good should be seen as a, an artistry of life. It should be seen as majestical, magical, because <laughs> it don't bloody feel like it when you're in the depths of something, but the lessons that you learn and the, the, the path that it takes you on obviously creates those pearls um, and those diamonds that um, don't feel like it when you're in the middle of it. So I'm <laughs> really, I'm really intrigued to hear your story. <laughs> You also mentioned that you got burnt out a couple of times. Um, so it'd be great for the listeners to understand sort of your journey and how you've got to where you, you are right now. So welcome, Joanna. It's a pleasure to have you. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me, Mel. And I'm, I'm so looking forward to our conversations because, or to our conversation, um, because I, I believe this idea of not settling in life is so, it's something that's talked about a lot um, in terms of this, motivational speaker circuit right um that's out there but how do you live that in your personal life um how do you make that practical how do you dare to live whatever your version of not settling is and i think for myself this um what you describe now that i'm calling myself an artist of life is an outcome of that process that i also went through so i have um to give your listeners a bit of a background i've I've really been, I would say I'm in my early thirties now, I'm 33 or almost mid thirties, <laughs> depending on how charming you want to be with me. <laughs> um, and I've, I've really throughout my twenties and, and early thirties, I've been on this journey of, I always wanted to have a life that's deep and rich and I wanted to see it all and I wanted to live it all. And I was always told, you know, that's not possible. Um, and I believed it to a certain extent and I still found my ways to rebel a little bit and, and try and I, you know I've, I've I started I co-founded a company when I was 20 with a family member and I did that while I was in uni and you know I, I looked into all different subjects at uni just because I was curious I had a major and then I always took courses on on the side I was a political science student and I went to economics and anthropology and I studied languages here and there I really I wanted to go broad rather than deep at that time and um my career at the same time also always shape-shifted a bit so I was in the art world for a little bit I was in journalism for a couple of years I entertained the idea of being a, a crisis um, reporter and I, I did report on a crisis during the summer of graduate school and then at some point I realized I had an, an inkling of, of realization at least that for me it's really important to not be employed and at least control my own schedule my own time so I became a freelancer <laughs> and that lasted for a, a couple of years. And then I thought, why not start a startup? And I did that. And uh, the startup was eaten by Corona, um, by the COVID-19 crisis. Um, and then what, what was the business, Joanna? It was uh, a travel, a travel technology startup. Um, and if you want, I can get into that a bit later um, to, to sort of complete the arc and you know I was in, in, in an investment training program for a while just because there were so many things I was interested in, and I really wanted to see it all and um, looking back when the startup um, you know didn't get anywhere because 2020 obviously was not the, the year to start anything in travel um, I was I was rather burnt out and I didn't actually notice it while I was doing while I was trying to bootstrap the startup with my own funds but afterwards, it was really this moment where I thought, oh, hmm, this, this hadn't gone well. And I decided to train as a coach because I wanted to help other founders avoid what I had gone through, which in a way is, a, I think, a very magnanimous idea to do. And at the same time, I think you also really need to reflect your own trauma and your own challenges and see if putting that into your profession is necessarily the best idea. And 
I did that for a little bit. <laughs> and I realized this fall, actually, that all of these things that I had tried and all of these things, these experiences I had gone through that, you know, I'm not trying to wrap up in a really nice narrative arc, but of course had gone through ups and downs because every time you do something and you fail, it feels not great. Mm -hmm. um, it, it actually really feels quite terrible. Um, I noticed I was judging myself for that quite a bit because it felt like I had tried so many things and I was this um, stereotypical jack of all trades, master of none. Until I remember that um, in the German language, one of my favorite words is Lebenskünstler, the artist of life. And in my native language, it has a really negative connotation because we are like, you know, an artist of life is somebody who's just doesn't really play by the rules and it's someone who's sort of doing their thing, but it's not proper. And I always thought that was so sad because when, when you look at it, an artist of life, really, it's a beautiful thing. You you have this artistry and the creativity in that term of being the artist. And at the same time, how you create is with life, right? It's, it's a bit more, maybe it's a bit abstract, but instead of a painter, this term to me had always been very endearing because instead of a painter or a singer or a dancer, your mode of creation is not the easel and the canvas, it's really life. And I thought about that and I realized actually that that's a way to frame this idea of trying and failing that seems to be part of who I am or my personality. I'm very curious. I want to see everything. I want to learn a lot. I want to experience also, not just the theoretical knowledge. I want to see and, and, and try on things for size, that that's not necessarily something bad. It's just how I want to live or how I'm compelled to live at the moment. And that there's actually a lot of experimentation and play to really embrace and that um it's also a way to to endear ourselves a bit with um this idea that we fail because it's not really fail it's either you learn or you win i think in some ways and i like it also because it it gives a bit of a more playful notion because when i look at um, I also briefly went to art school <laughs> and when i look at my um, my artist friend process of trial and error or you send yourself on these weird quote-unquote quests where you know, all of a sudden you decide Joanna, yeah I, I don't know what happened sorry to interrupt I don't know what oh. happened there. um you completely froze for oh. about 40, <laughs> 40 seconds so oh no <laughs> can, you, can you repeat what you were just talking about apologies sure. what what was the last thing you heard me say talking about your artist friends I think yeah so what I saw in my artist friends and I think that is um a good or an interesting approach to life, I think that we can carry over into the mainstream or for more quote unquote regular people who are not necessarily in the arts and with this concept of being an artist of life is really, when I look at them, they are very brave because they send themselves on these quests, right? Because when in the beginning you start a creative project, you don't know where it's going to lead you. You just have to trust that there will be an outcome for you. It might not be the outcome you want, but there will be an outcome and, and hope that it's good um and that I really like and there's also a lot of resilience you have to build up in this process because you you might you know when you think about a painter for instance you you paint and you might not like everything you create you might have to tweak things here and there you have to experiment with texture with colors it's not that you step up to the canvas and the first thing that's on there is perfect and but we expect that in life I think we expect that whatever we do is going to be fine um and especially when it comes to, I think it's a way, maybe a term or a way to look at life that helps us become a bit less risk averse and a bit more comfortable with accepting that doing things comes with the risk of failure and that that's okay. Um, and of course, it's always also about picking a risk that's, I think, um, doable for you. I'm not an advocate of you know doing huge, crazy things when it's something that you might not that might just stretch you a bit too far and i also don't think that's necessarily what artists do but they take calculated risks and that's something we can take back and integrate into our lives um through this concept of being an artist of life and i i call myself a multi 
disciplinary artist of life because I create through my work, through love, through my relationships, through trial and error, through travel, through seeking new experiences. It's really a fairly broad way of looking at things. And uh, I, I personally found that it, it really helped me to think also accept the flow of life a bit more. Um, mm. Yeah. It's interesting because um, I, I read your your introduction and it's it's so like most people's bios are duh, 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 right and you 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 it's very clear and you know easy to repeat mm -hmm. yours wasn't it was like wow okay this is completely different this is I don't know how to describe it like weavy what windy we it's the only it's the only way you know because everybody we've all got our own um energetic place and you attract like at, at times and our and our vibration is changing all of the time you know right and 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 I'm a singer um and Ooh. and I like the idea yeah, I like the idea of what you're saying because, and I, I, you know, I'm a I'm a singer. I'm very spiritual, but I was very in the corporate um, space for like over twenty years. Mm -hmm. And this whole notion of um, you've got to work hard, work hard, work hard. You know, and and you know, I was a single mom as well, and it it was. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I was the responsible one in the family in as much as trying to strive to get that money to make sure other people are okay. And, and it's, it's very, it's very box regimented. So reading your introduction was like, whoa, <laughs> you know, and even though I am, um, you know, an artist, I'm a singer, I've, I've written mm -hmm. songs. I haven't written songs for a while, quite a long while. Um, I hasten to add, which um, annoys me, but I'll get back to it at some point. Um, so, yeah, so in terms of, because you, you said before we came on, on air, if you like, that you mm -hmm. you'd recently changed your business and the way you look at it and the way you term it. Mm -hmm. So talk, talk around that in terms of how you got to this more magical way of expressing it. <laughs> Yeah, but I, I thank you so much for saying that. I uh, I will keep magical ways of expressing it very close to my heart. Um, <laughs> you know, to to be honest, I've and maybe there are people listening to this um, as well who who will resonate with this. I found it very challenging to put a label on myself. So because we like we like our things neat and we like our things boxed in, and of course it's. I, it, to a certain extent, I resent myself maybe 5% for making things a bit more complicated through this whole elaborate concept that I've created. And at the same time, it it feels a lot more like me and something that I can talk about in in, in more creative ways because it, it hinges and it touches upon so many areas. Like, you, you know, you mentioned your, your singing and the process um, that you're referencing. And I... I found it so hard when I, I wanted to use the experience I had, you know, through my burnout as a founder and sort of the life experience I had, which I think for someone in their early thirties is in some ways or mid thirties, whatever. <laughs> I, I still, think you're still allowed to say early. Um, is, is quite rich and quite deep in many ways. Um, and I wanted to use that experience to, to guide others in a pretty challenging path, which is being a founder and sometimes even being a founder of a, um, investor backed company because that's just a whole it's a rocket ship to sit on and, and so much happens in so much time uh, in so little time that it's it I've seen people and I've seen the toll it took on them so I I wanted to guide people but it didn't it was something that came from my mind and that was very logical but it didn't gel with me in terms of where it was emotionally or even you know as you're referencing energetics it also didn't really there was no flow there. And I tried to box myself into these, the neat boxes we know in the online world. Oh, you know, I'm an executive coach. I teach founders to create a life they love without stress or whatever it is. And, you know, the best thing is when you have a neat Instagram bio and it's, you know, one emoji, I do this. And then second emoji, I do this. And, you know, link below for whatever download it is. I still try to do that, to be honest, um, because it's also about making ourselves maybe 
providing information in a way that people can digest a bit more easily. But I just did not like this idea of, of putting a box around myself because I tried with this process I described, I already tried to put myself in so many boxes of journalist, you know, gallerist, of entrepreneur, founder, freelancer, student, all the things I've tried, um, blogger. <laughs> it was always one box. And then there was always this fascination or this curiosity for something else, right? I knew the main thing I was doing was pretty cool, but there was always, oh, but what about that other thing? And why can I only do one thing? Why does it have to be, you are a blogger, you are a journalist, you are a coach, and because you're a coach, you can't be silly. Or because you're a founder, you can't be making up your own rules about how much you work or how much you want to do things um, and, and how much balance you want to create in your life. It felt I felt boxed in for, I would say, probably 33 years in my life until I made this decision. And now I feel like as, as challenging as it is in terms of the marketing around it, and because it's still fairly recent, um, I would say that the entire process of this change has been going on since summer, but until I've been able to put words to it, um, it took quite a while. Of course, it would be good to have marketing wording right now that's a bit more you know, straight to the point, but maybe on the other hand, I think because I'm, I'm very much trying to create my own box or my own niche, my own space, maybe it's a good thing to actually just have it being the way it is right now and really explore what's possible with that. Because I also believe that the right people always will find you. Of course, you can make it a bit easier for them to find you. <laughs> yeah. um, and that's definitely part of, part of what I want to do. But in the end, I would say, and because I've gone through two burnouts, um, one in my early 20s and one in my early 30s, I've really seen, I would say in terms of health and energy, I've, I've paid a fairly high price for trying to make myself fit into boxes that I felt were not my own. So I would rather have it this way and take the risk um, than trying to yet again create a box around myself that's not mine yeah and and I completely applaud that um I don't know whether I would say I've ever burnt out I've certainly been frazzled I mean yeah there has been a couple of times where all of a sudden life didn't make any sense for a while mm -hmm. um and I can definitely relate to the boxing in you know I I mean, I'm, I'm older than you, I'm um, about 15 odd years older than you. Mm -hmm. And life, you know, every generation life changes quite a bit. You know, my, my son is 22 and wow, his life is completely different. And mm -hmm. it, they're almost born with a smartphone in their hand. <laughs> right? yeah. um, so, so how they see the world and, and the influences that they are being, you know, exposed to 24 seven and all of that sort of stuff. Um, for me, you know, and I'm sitting in between the the baby boomer and the Generation X, I think he is, mm. um, snowflakes, as my uh, brother likes to call them. And um, <laughs> and um, and it's hard because I I I had a 70s 80s upbringing mm. um, with very little money and uh, you know little, a lot of love but very little money and um, and then that shaped who I became and. Mm. So then that's that's what sort of drove me. You know, I knew my parents weren't self-sustaining going into old age. And mm. therefore somebody's got to do something about that. And that somebody happened to be me um, for whatever reason. So I put myself in the responsible box and the saviour box and I'm going to help everyone box. And mm. and doing all of that didn't serve me in the end. Yet it served me to a point, um, you know, I I've sound very similar to you you know tried lots of things very curious got mm. into property investment that sort of stuff I've tried a million different MLM businesses <laughs> and um trying to find the one to replace the rat race and you know all of that mm -hmm. and whilst living through all of those boxes it's really hard and, and also when you're very ambitious and the go-getter um where does spirituality come into that because oh, yeah. You know, I was in the spiritual closet for a long time, you know, and <laughs> it was only, um, it was, I mean, I've, I've done yoga for over 20 odd years, but a particular yoga teacher that I had um, a few years ago, she 
allowed me to step into, you know, to get my toe out of that closet and to eventually, mm -hmm. eventually embrace it. But it took ages, you know, I was scared of what people might think. And, um, and I thought, is this really me? I thought I was this, you know, I'm going to rule the world kind of person. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, so it's it's crazy the constraints that that we put around ourselves, mm -hmm. but obviously also influenced by the environment, the political agenda, the corporate, the family, yeah. the friends, the and everything else that gets thrown at us. Um, so yes, doing what you're doing is a hugely I was going to say brave pill. I don't know whether that's the right thing to say, but like you said, it's harder to, or well, maybe it's not, maybe that's just a constraint, right? So <laughs> it feels harder because it's different, mm -hmm. but, but different is good because if we were all doing the same thing, it would be really boring and you wouldn't stand out at all. You know, you have to do your, you have to do you mm -hmm. to, to get noticed and for people to really resonate the right people to really resonate with that mm -hmm. so so well done um thank you yeah <laughs> um, i really appreciate you saying that I, I i am interested to know what the you know you said you burnt out in your 20s and um and then this travel business talk a little bit more about that and and because obviously all of these things that happen in our past mm -hmm. we we can either sink or swim um oh yeah we either learn from it or we become a victim and moan about it for the rest of our life um, and blame everybody else except ourselves. So I'm interested to know what, what that looked like for you. Yeah, um, I'm happy to talk about that. And I, um, I also want to, um, you said something that, that also really resonated with me, which is this idea of being a go-getter and being a spiritual person and how you, how you bring those two together because it, it's almost funny to me that if you declare yourself um, a member of a religious organization, that's fine. Mm -hmm. um, but when you say, oh, you know, I like crystals and I like doing meditation and yoga. And sometimes I ask the universe for stuff and it gives me what I need or what serves me. Then you're totally, you know, you're seen as this bonkers person where, of course, you know, there's there's maybe boundaries to how we do it or, or limits to how we how we talk about this in interaction with others, especially when it's unsolicited. I find that sort of for any credence you might have, have that's a bit annoying <laughs> when somebody just springs it on you. Um, but that could be for anything. But it, you know, it always struck me as something funny that 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 is specifically that thing is so so touchy in a way. Like you don't want to, you don't want to be that person I don't know if, if that's what happened to you but I at least felt like that too where it's like but to what extent do I talk about it and to what extent um do I feel comfortable to say that and at some point I just said it once on my Instagram it's not a big topic I don't specifically always say you know this and energy and that but I think it's something that informs my work and it's just that um and it's so funny how it takes so much bravery to to mm -hmm. to talk about something that when when we deconstruct it or when you go you know when you take a step back or you look at it from the bird's bird's eye it it's not that terrible but we i built it up in my mind i built it up into this huge thing it's like oh god people are going to think i'm crazy and you know in the end <laughs> <laughs> um but with the burnout um i so the first company i co-founded was um, and it was a bit of a complicated relationship because I, I worked on the company with a family member and it was something that went on for four years. Mm, yeah, for four years to carry to completion. And we, we you know, I, at the time I was a student in university. I was still trying to figure out my path in life. I had and that was also in around the, the time of the economic crisis, 2008, 2009, when we started that company. And entrepreneurship was not cool at that time. It was not, you know, now I think with social media, it's, it's hyped up. It's really cool to be a founder and to be an entrepreneur. But back then I had, the, I think the first challenge I set up for myself is I had so much shame about it and I didn't want anyone to know. And I, you know, because I didn't want to be that person. It's like, mm, this company. 
with this family member. And I think even that cost me so much energy to not, you know, just as a baseline to not be true to myself in that sense. I mean, it's not something you want to shout from the rooftops, maybe if you're not comfortable with it, but it was really, I made it up to be this big secret. And I only told, I don't know, very close friends about it. And it, it felt like a really big weight I carried for a couple of years, especially at a time in my life where I was still trying to figure out what actually my next step was going to be. And I think in terms of that family member, there were also a lot of expectations around my role in this and my role going forward in this. And they had, I think, this big dynastic idea of how it had to be. And I didn't want that. Um, or I wasn't sure if that's what I wanted. Um, and at the same time, I wanted to maintain the relationship and take care of the relationship. So that was, there was constant inner tension and just as a baseline. And then at the same time, I was in university. I still had my curiosity. I wanted to try a lot of things. I wanted to see a lot of things. I, I really cared at the time also to be involved in, I think it was in student council. And I was doing, I was trying to still do volunteer work because that was something I did in, in high school that, that really mattered to me. And it was just the perfect storm, I think, of doing, being very ambitious and not yet knowing my boundaries or how to manage energy, which was definitely on me. And at the same time, having, not yet having learned boundaries in general and really knowing how to be more true to myself or how to say no to things I wasn't comfortable with, which I think was this whole operation in general. Um, and it went up to the point where I was about to graduate. I had just, I think I just handed in my bachelor's thesis when it all just went crumbling down for economic reasons. And I, that was sort of the implosion point really when I realized that this is not good. This is not good for me. And I had about a year where I basically almost didn't do anything. And I was, I was able, oh, actually it was the year before I handed in my thesis, I just realized. And I was able to, to craft that in a way so I could, I can quote unquote hide it in my CV if I have to, because I just went to uni um, for, I don't know, a semester or two longer. And, but I always had been doing so many things that nobody ever asked a question. Um, but I basically didn't do much for an entire year. I think I had one lecture I went to a week and that was a major event for me because I had to leave the house and I had to do stuff. And it was, I think it was earth shattering for me at the time because I, I was still so young you know, I was 20, 23 when that happened. And I, I could, I found it really hard to forgive, forgive myself for that for a really long time because I, and I think it actually took my second burnout to really, really learn and understand the patterns that had been going on because I, I felt I'd let down myself so much and to be this young and I'd already be at a point where physically, you know, I saw, um, a Chinese a TCM practitioner and I saw you know a bunch of um, practitioners and specialists around this not necessarily in traditional medicine too much but sort of in, in alternative and holistic healing facilities because I also felt like this was such a, a holistic problem to have at this age that maybe the more conventional approach wouldn't fix what's at the root of it, it excuse me and it took me it took me a year to get back to where I felt like I was me before. And because I was so young at the time, <laughs> I felt like, great, everything's the way it was before. I have so much energy now, so let's keep riding the circus. And I kept doing that. And with the second burnout, I think it was, let me see. Um, I'm also trying to be very as honest here as I can put it into words because I feel like what you know what annoys me so much is when we hear about these stories of people going through challenges online especially in the personal development space and it's told as a story afterwards and there's always this neat bow and everything after that they had the epiphany and everything was fine and for me with the first round of burnout I I I was the same. I thought, oh, I know everything now. This is great. I have learned everything about myself there is to know, and everything's good now. And well, you know, I was young and naive. Um, and then it happened the second time around, and I didn't, I, I really didn't see it coming because I felt like, oh, you know, I was such a go getter. And I was 
being an entrepreneur doing my own thing definitely I think is an ambition that aligns with who I am or who trying you know this whole idea again of um, building my own box but I wanted to prove to myself that I could do it um, that it was possible for me to have and run a company and that I could make true my very outsized ambitions um, because I always knew I had a lot of energy you know I always did very well in school I never really had to try so I knew I was very intelligent and I think that was also a very egoic way of looking at it just being like oh I'm awesome I'm gonna do this awesome thing now everyone get aside and I just and I think because of the hubris of of that I again put a lot of things on my plate during those two the three years um, because I was bootstrapping the company so I was working as a freelance consultant and I was doing my MBA and I was also in a program that would train entrepreneurs and people to become investors potentially so I did that too and I thought that was all really hunky-dory because I was so busy and everything was so fine because the world tells you being busy is good and COVID then hit and I I have occasionally I had conversations where people are asking me, but don't you think you're doing a bit too much? It's like, no, no, me, no. I am so happy. I love going to the coffee shop on Saturday morning and, and doing things. Who would not, right? Um, and then COVID happened. And during spring, it wasn't so evident yet because I was so, you know, with the client work I was doing, it was a very busy period for the company. So I was working even more and I still had a lot of other things to do. And then towards the summer of 2020, it became evident that trying to do something in the sphere of travel just wasn't going to be feasible and that it was eating up a lot of, it was incurring a lot of costs without, you know, any plausible expectation of turning, turning a revenue that year or potentially the year after and I decided I had to let go of that idea and maybe for someone listening to this um, maybe you've experienced this too when you're very much in love with an idea and your ego is also very much in love with an idea because it tells you something about yourself in my case being an entrepreneur and quote-unquote tech founder or CEO it is very hard to let that go because my my hands clawed onto that like claws of steel um, until it really got to a point where I had that, that, you know, in Germany, we have in spring, we have a couple of four day long holiday weekends because of bank holidays. And I spent all of those weekends in bed, taking naps, you know, two, three hour naps. And I thought, you know, just a long weekend, I'll be fine. And it was not fine. And that summer I, it got so bad that my mother actually intervened and said, you're, you're coming home now and you're going to chill in the mountains for a bit. And I, I did that. I finally realized I had to close the company. And then I took off some time from doing the client work and I took off three weeks. And I realized after those three weeks, really just pausing, I actually realized just how tired I was. I think just taking that, and I, I think I've heard that with people who've experienced um, burnout before, or also is that there is maybe your will or your the mind space you're in doesn't even let you see to what extent what's going on. And then as soon as you hit a pause or life gives you a pause button, that's really when when things actually get worse for you in, in the beginning because you you are confronted with the extent of what you've been doing or the the depth of just what's going on and that happened and it took me i would say another year of fixing that and but not fixing it and because it was this 10-year cycle i think of going through that experience of seeing oh wait i'm 32 31 32 this happened to me not even 10 years ago. What This is a pattern. Because if it happens once, it's not ideal. If it happens twice, especially to someone who's still fairly young and you know, I don't have a family, so it's not that there's this intricate, intricate layer of responsibilities that might, you know, like you described it, that might just feel like you, you, people are tearing at you from all different sides. But this was something that I've created entirely for myself. It was not something that 
anyone else did to me. It was something I created and it was me, my expectations and where I felt I had to redeem myself for maybe something that felt like a really big failure with the company in my early 20s. Um, and so in a sense, it was rebuilding my health and making sure that I'm well again um, and I don't need to sleep 14 hours a day and take naps. Um, but really it was looking inward deeper and taking a look at what, what were the patterns that led me to that? How spiritually also, why was I doing what, what I was doing? Where, where are my wounds? What contributed to this need for me to really, really, what feels like I needed to prove myself just by showing how much I can do, how smart I am and how great I am um, and how I'm seen in the world as you know, a tech founder, because that's the cool thing. Um, I feel like in the millennial generation and, and also becoming very aware how I manage my energy. And I actually realized that my energy is not linear. Um, so I feel like some people, they get up and they, they can just go every day, which is this sort of ideal we have in a society, this go-getter. And for me, it seems more, I work in spikes and then I need to rest and then I do something and I can go, it, it can be very intense and then I, I can rest or I need to rest. And that all of those realizations and, and the learnings I had to go through, which were not fun <laughs> because I had, I had definitely imagined um, a, a different future for myself, I would say, um, looking I'm back to that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, cause you always, you always think out, every, you always think everything's going to work out great and it's going to be perfect and sparkly. And that was not my version of perfect and sparkly. Um, but in the end it was what I needed. And I, I really needed to go through that to learn how to be better, to, how to be kind with myself and how to be, um, very mindful of my boundaries, be very mindful of what I actually want to do and what I think I want to do because it, it serves some end that maybe society or other people's expectations are dictating. And, you know, not to say that I'm perfect at it now. <laughs> it's, I think, a learning process for everyone as long as we're here. Um, but it was, it was the lesson I had, or I'm, I'm grateful for the lesson because it was a huge redirection away from a path that I think had I been on this longer and had COVID not happened. Um, and I think also had my mother not intervened, to be honest, um, I think this could have been a lot more detrimental to me and my, my health um, than what it turned into. And it's given me Ultimately, it's given me a much better relationship with myself. And I feel that's probably, when I think about wealth, you know, the different forms of wealth you can have, being more in tune with yourself and actually being more comfortable with yourself, understanding yourself better is to me really, it's a significant column or a significant pillar of wealth because if you don't like yourself, you can achieve all the things you want and as tried as it sounds, it's not going to help because you're always going to strive for more. Not to say that you know when you like yourself, you're not striving for things, but you're in a place where you can question it a lot better and where you can really look at, well, do I want this because I want it or do I want it because somebody else wants it for me or they tell me this is good for you or do I want it because me wanting that is going to make me look really cool to other people or respectable or, you know, whatever your term for being seen positively in society is. Yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. I, I thought I was going to be a millionaire by the time I was 30. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, still striving for that one. Um, but, but not so, you know, you talk about wealth and it's not about being a millionaire. It's about being happy where you happy in your own skin it's about being happy in the moment that's a tough one because so many people are you know it's all about tomorrow it's all about the goal it's all about whatever um and we know there's no such thing as tomorrow and there's no such thing as yesterday all we have is right here right now mm -hmm. and uh, it reminds me of a 
I'm, I'm probably going to butcher this, but my a friend of mine shared um, a Zenist uh, parable, just a very short thing the other day. And he didn't understand, he's very, I mean, he's very Zen, very Buddhist, very mm. spiritual, but also very left brained, you know, so the science mm, as well. Yeah, so he's got the whole thing going on. And um, and he's into his music as well. And uh, he, yeah, so this little story is the, the student goes to the monk um, and says, I, I need to know what my purpose in life is. Mm. And um, or how do I know, you know, what my purpose in life is? And the the monk says to him, well, what have you just done? I've, I've just had my breakfast. <laughs> and um, he said, okay, then wash your bowl. So, and that's it, by the way. Mm -hmm. And so my friend was like, didn't get it for a long time. And he's very out there. Mm -hmm. um, but that is it. You're, th the next thing is to wash the bowl. You know, mm -hmm. that, that's what you have to do. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter how big the next thing is or how small it is. It's just the next thing. Mm -hmm. And so many people don't get that. And me included, by the way, we're all, we all run away with things. The ego gets in the way and, um, and the responsibilities get in the way and they put the stress on and money's running out and oh God, you know, and, um, without trusting in ourselves and without trusting in the universe that, and like you said, it's what you that burnout was what you needed mm. to teach you what you are now going to do and, and want to share with people. Um, and it's exactly the same for all of us, but, but the majority of people might have an inkling that maybe, yeah, they probably should be doing something different, but mm. haven't got the um, courage or they haven't got the know-how or just don't know how to change it, you know. Mm. Um, so yeah, it's um, it's so needed and it's so needed from so many different perspectives because there are a lot of coaches out there all talking the same message and there are 7.5 billion people in this world or whatever it is and, <laughs> you know, yeah. and everyone's different. Yeah, for sure. And I, um, I really like our conversation because you, you have a very succinct way of putting things. And I just thought um, what you what you mentioned about your friend with the bowl is it's so sometimes it's so this this type of wisdom is so challenging to comprehend sometimes because you it makes you think, but what just wash the bowl, dry the bowl, what no, that can't be it. And I I sometimes I have this image in my mind when we when we think about our lives, um, especially with this idea of being an artist of life, is there's maybe there's this tapestry that we're weaving, and each thing we 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 experience or each thing we do, it could be you know big project like starting a company, but it's also cleaning the bowl, and it's all it's a thread, right? And one thing maybe it's just a thread in a certain color, maybe it's a golden thread when something's really nice, or maybe it's a sort of muddy colored looking thread when things are not so nice. Um, and sometimes you have bigger patches in a tapestry, you know, that form maybe a, a picture, a figure or something that, you know, could be the big items that happen in your life. But really when you look at it, it's made up of, you know, thread by thread, somebody has to weave it. And it's the different colors that we're weaving. And this idea of, I find it very challenging still to be in the flow of life and to say, oh, you know, today I'm just going to do this and oh I'm cleaning the bowl but then sometimes I remember to to pull myself back into the moment and remind myself actually your life also consists of cleaning the bowl cleaning up being in the present and it's I find this especially challenging with social media because we're so social media has been around for about a decade now um, or especially Instagram the, the very visual kind and we're so used to seeing people's highlight reels or we're seeing you know displays displays of emotion or now i feel like this whole confessional thing is, is also um become fairly big and but it's all in a way it's an interaction and sometimes it doesn't always feel genuine because it is mediated by that platform and its rules and what you have to do to get engagement or do whatever and we're used to people's lives looking really perfect or sometimes when i scroll i see 
it's it's always great to have people to expand you and, and show you also what's possible but then you know you look at someone who's taking on maybe their 10th vacation this year and it's you know good for them but and there you're sitting cleaning your bowl and you're wondering what am I doing wrong <laughs> that I'm here cleaning bowls and the other person <laughs> in the Maldives and that can serve as inspiration of course to question but do I want this? What do I need to do to, or what do I assume I need to do to get there? And does this really make me happy? Or is it just going there, being somewhere that people tell me is pretty and cool to go to. And because I actually want a break from what I'm doing because it's making me miserable. Um, all of that can happen, or it's just you wanting to go there and wanting to see it. Um, but it's really about striking this balance between the very cool moments that are, you know, in our highlight reel, and also appreciating the now of cleaning the bowl because it's not, and I think this was also an, is, an, is an ongoing lesson for me to, to maybe strive with intent or to be mindful, even in this life of not never settling or not settling and really doing your thing that the the path of just already deciding to deviate or to when you were talking about a lot of people being miserable because they're doing things that don't make them happy even just taking one step in the direction you know intuitively in your gut in your I don't know wherever you feel it in your body feels better that's also good already I feel like we're very right now we're very attached to the goal because also I feel goal setting is a very big big very big thing and you know come come three weeks on January 1st, everyone's going to have, you know, huge lists of resolutions and how everything's going to be better in 2022. And I wonder if that's actually necessary to that extent, or if we, if we need goals in, in that strict of a way, or if the goal should be, what can I do to be happier? What can I do to be more content? Um, what can I do to be more fulfilled uh, or financially stable or things like that, that are a way of talking to ourselves that's also kinder not so rigid that allows for playfulness and that allows a margin of error because life tends to come with trial and error and not just perfection as I've had to learn <laughs> yeah yeah I, it, there is something in the energy right now I've been through um quite a process the last few days um largely so so in terms of building my coaching business and and things not being as easy at times and being hard on yourself you know come on Mel you've been in sales for over 20 years come on what you know what the hell you know and all that negative self-talk and and then trying different things to to find those people and it's not working mm -hmm. and you keep doing it and it's still not working you know it's that mm -hmm. definition of insanity um, and then it's, it's, it's having the courage to try something different because what, what if it was just a numbers game, you know, and right. and in the next five, it would work, you know, and, and mm. all of these things that go through your mind. Um, but certainly, I think it, certainly this week, the energy seems to be intense for a lot of people with, mm. you know, with what's going on in the world. And <clears throat> I certainly have been uh, subject to that in as much as I'm very very passionate about what I believe is the truth mm -hmm. and for some people that comes across as judgmental and mm -hmm. I've I've had that smack me in the face in the last few days really in as much as it presented itself with a very dear friend mm -hmm. and in in after that I was in denial you know the ego was strong um, and then I've had a series of conversations since, including some podcast interviews that have been illuminating. Mm -hmm. And um, and the thing that I have always said ever since I was a young girl was everybody deserves to be heard. And mm -hmm. I mean that, you know, mm -hmm. you could be a murderer, a rapist, whatever. I would sit there and I would listen. Mm. Um, and I've not been doing that mm. in the last 12 months or so mm -hmm. because I've been so in the thick of what's right and wrong mm -hmm. so yeah so I've had a massive wake-up call really this this week and and also a realigning back to 
the trust in myself, the trust in the intuition, you know, listening to the intuition mm-hmm. um, and trying not to and, and realizing to stop banging my head against a brick wall, you know, and um, and also take a chill pill. You know, yeah. I, I loved what you said about you've got peaks and troughs and energy and I'm the same. But when when you're in that trough, mm. you're like, I'm lazy. I should be doing this. Oh, I should, yeah. You know what I mean? And mm-hmm. especially when you're a go-getter and obviously you've been spinning a lot of plates over the years. Um, it's really hard, isn't it? To allow that to just be that. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. Just I, point. yeah I feel you on that. <laughs> yeah. Do you, what, what do you do um, when you're in the trough? Um, how do you, how do you soothe your, the inner the inner dialogue that's that's going on i when i came out of the corporate world which was only last year um mm-hmm. it it takes time for that unraveling to happen because you're mm-hmm. so regimented in whatever that routine looked like for you and and you and you do feel like you're like being lazy or, or whatever but but then being surrounded by people that were in a similar situation or have been in a similar situation and they're like, it just takes time. Be mm-hmm. kind to yourself. And, and it's accepting those words. And, and even though you, you can feel it as a truth, there, there is still that resistance that I need to be doing more. I need to be doing more. Mm-hmm. But what I've come to learn, I suppose, really quite recently is if I have a day where I've got no motivation and no focus mm-hmm. and all I want to do is go and watch Netflix <laughs> um, even though I've got on you know I'm not a great fan of Netflix but I do like some of the stuff that's on it mm-hmm. um, then that's okay mm-hmm. if, I, if I just need to zone out and just watch some either it, uplifting stuff or just mindless crap that's just going to take me away from from where I am now maybe that's escapism and it probably is escapism (laughs) but in that moment of doing that I feel grounded I feel um sort of held by myself I'm I'm allowing myself to do this it's not something I would have done a few years ago Mm -hmm. um so yeah it's allowing it's it's being it's being my own mother, I suppose, and allowing myself to take the day off mm-hmm. and being okay with that. And don't get me wrong, you know, I even today I know there's things piling up that I need to get done. And I'm thinking we're getting closer to Christmas and it's going to get harder, you know, and all of these things. Mm-hmm. Um, but then I'd stop myself and I'm like, but it doesn't matter. The only person that's pushing you to get all these things done is you. Mm-hmm. nobody else cares you know? <laughs> yeah um, and it's being okay that it's not going to all happen tomorrow if it takes mm-hmm. another three months tough shit it takes another three months mm-hmm. um and all of the things that I try to achieve and didn't at certain times of my life that I beat myself up about many many times mm-hmm but I've now turned that into, you know, what you've said in terms of it's the life lessons and it's the, it's the, it's built me to the person I am today. It's built me to the the fact that I now feel that I can share my wisdom and my listening with people that need this. Mm -hmm. Um, And without all of that, I wouldn't have this to be able to do that. You've got to have that experience to know how to help people. So I don't, I'm not sure that particularly answered the question. It sort of answered it, but, um, yeah it's just a case of giving myself the day off being kinder to myself um and remembering I'm just a little girl Mm. and I would never talk to a little girl like I talk to myself so Mm. yeah yeah especially the last part Mm. is so so important because we we can be so mean to ourselves I would not talk to anyone the way I'm talking to myself yeah Ooh, yeah absolutely and jo- joanna who mm-hmm. who who is your uh, i'm trying to box things in now but <laughs> who is your ideal client you know who mm-hmm. somebody's listening to this now and, and yeah. they're 
feeling your words mm -hmm. what do you think that person looks like or, or is that irrelevant um <laughs> right when you're when you're so far out of the box um is are, are things things are still relevant um but people people can come to me for um for certain for certain things um for certain questions i don't necessarily have the ideal client avatar where it's you know it's somebody who's 35 and older female you know wants to start a business or something like that it's it's not that what i what I can help people with is this whole idea of that I described of being an artist of life, which of course sounds quite abstract, but really when you break it down um, to a more everyday level is, is really how to accept, I think, failure and experience um, and how to allow yourself to have a bit more joy and beauty in your life um, because the arts are also here to, to enhance our lives, to give us a sense of beauty of joy um and not everybody needs to be an actual artist but i think it's also when i look at people right now um, especially because we're going through such challenging times i sometimes see them just zone out you know they're not in the present it could be today in the alps where i am is it snowed over the night overnight and we have the sky was so blue it was like a sapphire today and then we have all those you know I see white trees um, and the town I'm in is it's very historical. It looks like out of a children's books illustration when it snowed. And I, I went to the farmer's market on Friday and I, I practically skipped there because it was so beautiful. And I'm not saying that my experience of, of beauty or joy has to be the norm, but when I pass people and I see that they can't see it and I see that they're so caught up in their own misery or in their own oh you know this didn't work out i'm bad i can't do this i can't do that oh you know i failed again whatever i get quite sad for them um of course it's their choice to do that but if you are listening to this and if you feel like oh i do want to live life a bit differently and maybe i don't have the courage to or i don't know how to or i just want to talk to someone about this then that is something people can come to me for the other thing that's a bit more concrete is my my big talent is is getting people off the couch and into action um and i help people with when they come to me for a one-on-one -on -one session for instance when you know again if they're afraid of making a change or they have this you know people i don't know why but i think i have this <laughs> this magnet around me every time i was on the train a bus a plane I always, the person who wanted to change their life and didn't know how to do it, always found me. It was like, you know, just a magnet and then, you know, another eight hour plane ride. And it's just like, da, 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 but what I do, what I do, what I do. And people tend to come to me for that. You know, what's my next step? Or I'm, I'm paralyzed. I don't know. Do I go forward, backward, sideways, left, right? Um, I need to talk to someone who's very non-judgmental or who can just hear me out and who's not going to kill my dream or my idea. That tends to be what people gravitate towards me um, for. Uh, so if you're listening and you have any of that, then uh, great. <laughs> Get in touch. Um, I'm good at sparking people into action. Um, I'm not so good at holding their hand while they're then taking, you know, the 500 next steps because other people are better. You know, as I said, my energy moves in, in peaks and I can gift you with, you know, experiencing that peak to get you going, sort of like flicking the first domino. Um, but then if you want someone who holds your hand for this for you know, six months or 12 months, then other people are better at that because their experience and their energy is a bit better than that. But if you're really, if you're stuck and you want to get unstuck, then I'm the person. <laughs> okay. And how could people find you? Um, they can find me um, at my website, um, www.johannaranath.com. Um, and I go on social media under the same name. I have an Instagram under that name i'm on TikTok, even though reluctantly <laughs> we'll see that's a new that's a new experiment um and i also write i wrote um if you go i write a newsletter um whenever i feel like it and i feel like i have something positive to contribute so i can't tell you if it's you know once a week or once a month um where where you can you know be in touch with me and i wrote the artist of life manifesto that you can download from my website where I talk a bit more about that and you know how you can achieve the sort of 
very etherical idea maybe of, of living your life like an artist creating a masterpiece and I wanted if I may <laughs> because you said something about watching Netflix on the couch and I think to be honest the Netflix epiphany is absolutely underrated <laughs> what can happen when you just allow yourself to you know take a moment and just zone out and maybe be a little bit of a brain zombie because sometimes things bubble up from your subconscious and mm. I don't know about you I've definitely sat in front of Netflix and then all of a sudden a light went on in my head and it was it was amazing you know and all of a sudden I had this moment of clarity or you know same could happen as going on a walk but I am um, a fan of the Netflix epiphany. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just trying to think if I've ever had a, a light bulb moment with Netflix. I, I think, I think when I allow myself to do that, I'm that just leading to mm -hmm. be a zombie. Yeah, but that's what that's what matters for me in that moment. Um, mm -hmm. But I know I'll keep an eye on that one. So I like that. <laughs> um, okay, well, cool. Thank you so much. It's been a, a real pleasure to meet you mm -hmm. and, and to hear your wonderful voice. Um, because Likewise. It, it is a wonderful voice. Um, <laughs> it's one of those voices that gives you little tingles on your head. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I, I strive to do that. <laughs> um, Thank you. Would you like to um, say any last, anything that comes up for you um, to the listeners? and um, the world um anything that you'd like to share famous famous last words famous um, last words, yeah i yeah i what i what i would love to leave with is because sometimes when we hear people talk about making life changes and being bold and living life their way and never settling it it sounds like a mountain that is so tall we can never climb it because sometimes when you're at the beginning of this process it feels entirely unrealistic and I want to encourage you to to allow yourself to see that of course it's a process which is the most trite thing I can say now I guess but to to allow yourself to just take one step just, just take the first step forward and just experiment and see what happens when you do something that you don't usually do. And it could start with choosing a, a show on Netflix you would never touch because it sounds so weird. You never know what type of gold or magic or glitter fairy dust is in there for you. Um, but once you start, you allow yourself to make choices because you like them and it's something you want to do then you're much, much clearer, much closer to the path that might be this new thing you want to do or the path to yourself. Because when we sometimes talk about guilty pleasures, for instance, why would it be a guilty pleasure? If you like it, do it. And if you don't like it, don't, but don't make it something that you like, but feel bad about that mm. makes no sense in life. Um, and similar to that, if you have something in your life that you feel very drawn to and you don't know why and you, you, you feel like you need to rationalize it away or you need to rationalize it to yourself that you actually are allowed to do it, then I would like to remind you that you are an adult and you are allowed to make your own choices. Um, legality, of course, within the framework of legality. I don't want to encourage anyone to do anything, you know, supremely stupid. Um, but you're allowed to do that. And you're allowed to do things that seem weird to others if they make you happy. So I would say go forth and enjoy your weirdness. <laughs> <laughs> love it, love it. Oh, thank you. And uh, thanks again um, for your time and gracing us with um, those wonderful, magical words. And um, I wish you all the very best, Joanna. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much, Mel, for having me and for this for giving me this opportunity to share this idea of being an artist of life and for your very insightful listening. No problem. Thank you. Thank you.